Hi, and welcome to The Branded Accountant. My name is Philippa Haynes from Insight 101, and I would like to introduce my partner uh, in crime for these videos, Richard Bruin. Do you want Hi, to everyone. introduce yourself, Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Richard Bruin, uh, Managing Director of Progress Barmore Bruin. Uh, we provide mentoring and coaching support for small firms and accountants. Great. And Insight 101 is all about helping um, accounting firms to stand out. And today we're talking about the enemy of time. Last week, we talked about why different is really important, even for professional services like accountants, incredibly important to differentiate ourselves. So that was the key message last week. This week, it's about how can we um, create more time uh, by taking time out of our business and actually thinking about our brand and thinking about our clients and sculpting a service which suits us and suits them much better. Uh, Richard, give us a, a little bit of a, a heads up on what we're going to be talking about then. Yeah, time is the number one challenge for accountants. Um, being too busy is a phrase that we hear far too often. And as accountants, we quite often know what we should be doing with our firms but it's finding the time to do those things, which is the number one challenge. Um, there's plenty of tips and tricks on the, on the internet about how you can save time. What we wanted to focus on here is not so much that sort of short-term approach to it, but very much how you can create more time within your firm long-term. By, by focusing on the right things in the right way, you can actually make much more use of the time that you have available to you. Uh, and of course, we all have the same amount of time available to you. It's how we control it and what we do with it that is key. And what we want to do here is to link that sort of thinking to the wider pictures of your brand and the culture within your firm to create time almost organically, if you like, within your firm. Totally agree. And I think one of the reasons we pulled this together was because during the COVID period, which hopefully is now you know, out of the way and we're moving forward, but that notion of time had become even more warped. Um, it just became a real pressure cooker, didn't it? With clients um, obviously seeking a lot of help and accountants feeling completely overwhelmed. And so this notion of time is, you know, it, it, it's a difficult one. But we hope that with what we're going to talk about today, we can at least show that there is a route forward and that a little bit of time invested on the business is going to make an incredible difference to the day to day in the business. Um, so what have you seen, Richard, over the COVID period and coming out of that? What, what um, have clients said to you um, about that time? I think there are two main things that stand out. First of all, since last March, um, we've proved to ourselves what we can do. We, we've proved just how much we can change, how we can adapt, how we can raise our game and support our clients, how we can work more flexibly as businesses. So I think we've learned a huge amount for ourselves on our own businesses, um, which is great. And there's some real positives to come out of that. But the other thing as well is that um, as a result of last year, we've all changed psychologically mentally it's, it's affected us all um, people's priorities will have changed people's thinking will have changed and we need to recognize that with clients clients i think we can expect and are seeing are going to be even more demanding going forwards and so are going to be even more challenging of our time and what we need to do is make sure that we continue this raised game that we've demonstrated in a way that actually meets those increased demands from clients as well without us being swamped yeah. And I mean, even just looking at LinkedIn at the moment, you know, there are posts, endless posts about people saying that they have experienced burnout in the past. And actually, a lot of people commenting that they are very close to it. So, you know, we do understand um, that this is affecting everybody. And of course, as you said, we all have a finite amount of time. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a little bit about boxing clever, isn't it? and maybe taking that time out, just, it doesn't need to take too long. I mean, some of the clients that I work with, you know, they have a turnaround of about two weeks going from low confidence and I just don't feel like I'm in control anymore through to high confidence, knowing exactly what their business is about, what their firm is about, knowing what the key message is, and then being able to create 
that dialogue with their current clients and also their prospects quite quickly. Yes, it's, it's that clarity and that focus that um, fundamentally creates time. Um, and that's hopefully what we can we can you know, bring to you in the next sort of 30, 40 minutes. But to be clear in how you use your time is, is, is the thing. And that's why we want to focus here on a, a more long term permanent solution than just some of the usual you know, um, tricks and yeah. tips that you can use just to create five and 10 minutes here and there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just b before we drill down into that, because there is something quite practical and pragmatic that we can do straight away. I mean, from from my standpoint, you know, it's very easy for a consultant to say, oh, it's all about brand and marketing and you need to work on your business um, and, and get out of that business. Um, but equally, you know, in order to grow and progress and also have control over not only your, your, your marketing content, your social media, your website, um, but your, your team as well. Having this time and this um, ability to talk about where your business is going and what the brand's all about actually helps all of the team to work more effectively, more productively, and everybody's just that little bit happier. So from my perspective, um, whilst it seems very easy to bang on about brands and marketing, there is quite a serious um, message that goes with that, which is you can begin to plan and have some stages, if you like, in order to help manage that business. So without further ado, shall we talk about the first thing that a firm can do and I know that you talk very much to your clients about segmentation. Yes client segmentation is um, in my opinion probably the single most important thing that you can do in your firm. Yeah we're talking here about time and time is wasted by having the wrong clients and by having the wrong team members and by doing the wrong things. Um, and therefore, conversely, time is created by having the right clients and the right team. And, and segmentation is a, is, is a way of achieving that and also making sure that you then focus your services and your approaches in the most efficient way to the different sorts of clients that you have. You know, so segmentation is fundamentally linked to your culture and your brand. That, that's why it covers as a topic that we, that we do. But it's the it. It's the thing that makes the single most powerful difference within any firm. And it's shall I bring up shall I bring up that slide that helps you? Yes, talk, please do. Talk through it. Um, hold on a minute. Let me just share my screen. Uh, uh, there we have it. Can you see that, Richard? I hope. Yes, I can. There you go. Okay. So let me just scroll through. Stop share. That's not going to work now. Uh, this always happens, doesn't it? Uh, let me go on to the next slide. Yeah. So this should be the segmentation slide. Oh, hold on. This is another lesson in how to stay calm. OK, can you see that, Richard? Um, I, I can, yes. If, if we can't get this any larger, we can go with that. No. So here, here is the, this is the, um, a, a, an example of, of client segmentation. Segmentation is a technique that you can use um, in a number of areas in your firm. It, we're going to talk about it in the context of clients here, but equally it's, equally it's relevant when you're talking about your team, for instance. And fundamentally, segmentation is recognising that all clients aren't the same. And, and as firms, we tend to treat all clients the same and consequently, we end up not quite getting it right with any of our group of clients. So let me just talk you through um, what I'm, what I'm, what we're showing you here. On the left hand side, you see we measure the quality of the relationship. Now, this is an entirely um, subjective process that we go through here. This is something that you can apply across your client base within within a matter of minutes, deliberately so. So, left hand side shows us the quality of the relationship. Above that line, you are happy with the relationship with that client. They're good people to work with. You enjoy working with them. They're respectful. They're trustful of you and your advice. Below the line, the relationship is problematic. It doesn't work for you. This isn't a great relationship with those clients. 
And then to the right, we're measuring that against the level of financial return that you see from that client. Now, you can be as quantitative as you want in this case. I prefer to be subjective again. So to the right of that vertical line, we're saying that as a firm, you are happy with the level of financial return that you get from that client, be it the gross fees, be it the profit that you make from them. Whereas to the left of that line, we're saying that actually the return isn't what you want it to be. It's not to say that you're making a loss with that client, but it's to say that you're not making as much money as you would like from that client. So we then break that into the four boxes, A, B, C, and D. If we start with the top right, your A clients, these are your best clients. These are the clients where you are very happy with the relationship, they're very happy with the relationship and where you get a great financial return. It works for you from a business perspective. The chances are you don't have that many of these sorts of clients in your firm, but these are the cream of the crop, your best clients. The reality is that most of your clients are probably B clients. So you see a B client there. We're very happy with the relationship. They're nice people to work with. They're very pleasant to work with but we don't make the sort of money that ideally we would like to from them as a client. And this is probably because most of those clients are pretty much compliance-based clients at the moment. They could be startups, they could be small businesses, they could be businesses going through financial problems, but generally they will be compliance-based businesses. They're not particularly entrepreneurial. And so they tend to spend their budget on the compliance tasks rather than the more value-added tasks, but they're good clients. Below the line is a different kettle of fish. So we have the C clients. C clients are clients where you make a good return, you've got good fees with those clients, but who are a pain in the neck to deal with. They demand everything doing now. They don't reply to your correspondence. They may be rude to your team. And to the left of them, it gets even worse because we have the D clients where not even, not only is it a poor relationship, but actually you don't make any money off them out either. So we need to recognize that we've got four distinct groups of clients here. The first thing to recognize is that the chances are is that it's the C and the D clients who dominate your time. These are the people who demand your attention. <coughs> Excuse me. We want everything doing now. And consequently, you get pulled towards them. Your resources get pulled towards them and neglect those A clients, the very people that you should be spending your time with. So we need to remove the C's and the D's. And as you can see, as I put on screen there, D's is straightforward. We don't like them. They don't like us. We don't make any money on them. It's bizarre that they actually exist in their firm, but I can promise you they exist in every firm. But we need to identify them and remove them. And the best way to remove them is just to price them out of the marketplace, just to increase their fees and increase their fees until they get the message and go. But they can't stay in your firm. The C clients, the only difference between a C and a D, bear in mind, is that the C we make some money on. So that warrants a conversation. We need to sit down with the C client and explain why the relationship isn't working for us. Could be multiple reasons on that. It could be as simple as communication. The messages between us and the client aren't right. We don't understand the client. The client doesn't understand us. By having a conversation, there's a chance that we could put that right, in which case that client would then become an A client. If the client isn't prepared to change or we can't sort out the problems, the client inevitably is then classed as a D client and has to go as well. So a C client temporarily may be in that box, but they have to be moved. The, the aim here is to remove C and D clients from our firm so that we can focus on the A and the B clients. Having done that, that now gives us the time to spend the time with the A clients, which is where the human interaction should really be. These are the clients where we can develop the value added services, where we can develop greater relationships, where we can develop a more strategic, more entrepreneurial based approach. And the B clients, we can make more profitable for us as a firm, A, by systemizing the approach, having our team, our managers work with them, making sure that we've systemized all our processes really efficiently. So the client's not necessarily spending any more money, but they're more profitable to us. And also then by educating those clients using workshops, seminars, whatever it may be, to move them along that line towards being a client. But we have the time to do that because we've removed the negative influence of the C and D clients. In a nutshell, that's client segmentation, but it's a very, very powerful tool. Yeah, and it, it, it's used a lot, um, certainly with, with, with large brands. I, I've worked on a lot of uh, segmentation um, and it's a very strong and powerful tool. One of the 
things I wanted to talk about, because this is obviously, let's take control of what we have currently. Let's look at the list of clients that we have and start to dissect them, um, analyze them and understand who's taking up the time, who's making the money and how we go forward. I guess once we've done that, one of the key things that you can do from a brand and marketing perspective is start, once you've identified those perfect A clients, how do you get more of them? Because what we want to do moving into the future is shift that balance, don't we? So we want to have more of the really good A and B and fewer of the C and D. And of course, if you've got rid of the C and D, yes, you're concentrating on your better clients who bring more, but equally, you probably want more of those in the future to grow your business. And that is, of course, all about branding and marketing to the right people. So the branding part is defining who you want to speak to, who you want as an ideal client. And then the marketing is actually to put out messages to attract them. And from my perspective, it's quite a simple exercise to define who the ideal client is. Although I think a lot of people get very caught up um, they struggle to do that. But when you look at your A client, also think about who they are as clients. What's their mindset? What's their attitude? Is it a specific sector as well that gels with you? Try and define it beyond the, the more sort of um, tangible aspects of are they making money? You know, do they take up all of my time? But equally think about them in a more rounded way too, and say, what is it that characterizes them? Is there a theme? Because if there is, that can be the main thrust for you to start building your brand and your firm around them. So if you know what rings their bell and you know how they are attitudinally, then you know how to talk to them and you know how to set up your website, you know how to talk to them in a post on social media. A conversation I had yesterday uh, was with somebody who was an accountant and they went to a branding session, a little bit like this, talking about uh, the business. But the person who was talking about it pulled up this idea of an avatar and saying, oh, they like coffee, they like this. That we are trying as an accountant to talk to another client, another business. And so we, what we want to understand is the mentality, not of a single person, but the mentality and the ethos and the culture of that business. So whilst you may have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it probably means that the, what you like about that person, that individual is what um, that business is all about. So ensure when you're thinking about the mindset and the attitudes, etc., think about the ethos and the culture of that perfect client. So that that would be my my kind of brand hat advice. Is there anything that um, you would want to add to that, Richard, from a an accountant's perspective? I think this it highlights how we can bring performance and culture and brand together because if we don't focus on those a clients then we don't build up the the understanding of those clients as strongly as potentially we could uh, and by doing that that's how we drive more business that way if, if you if you look at the, that that segmentation then the chances are at the moment if you look at your referrals for instance Purely on a numbers game, most of your referrals will be B clients because yeah. that's, that's what you most have. Their clients are quite happy with you. That will drive the business. You're unlikely to get referrals from C's and D's. So most of your referrals will come through B clients. So you're sort of driving yourself down a cul-de-sac if you don't focus, shift your own focus to the A clients. Now I get it that what stops you doing that is time, which is why it's so important to remove the D's, remove the C's, systemize the bees have your team working with the bees the bees will be quite comfortable with that because that delivers the service they want anyway and they will still see you as their accountant but you are focused on the a's so you have the time to sit down to ask them the right questions to listen to those responses and not only will that generate you more work from those a clients 
but it will help you to better understand what you need to reflect in your brand to attract more of that sort of client because you've got a better understanding of who they are, what they're all about, what drives them, what keeps them awake at night, what are the big issues that you want to then highlight in your branding and in your marketing to then resonate with similar A clients. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about the referral system, because I hear about that a lot with people saying, oh, well, we don't need to, you know, we, we don't need to advertise or get involved in marketing because we, we rely on word of mouth and referral. But as you say, if we've got the wrong clients referring people in, you know, it's probably going to be the wrong client again. So that it, it just, as you said, it, it creates this cul-de-sac of, you know, constantly being busy, constantly having the wrong clients, constantly being harassed and really not being able to take control of that dialogue. So if you know your A clients really well, you know, even if it is a referral from them, it's much more likely that they are able to talk to that client, um, that referral and say, this is how they work. This is what they're all about. This is what they'll be looking for. And so there's that self-select um, benefit as well I think yes it, it's all part of taking control you know the reason time is such a big problem for um all, all those accountants is because essentially we don't control our firms enough we don't control our systems our clients our processes our marketplace enough and so re referrals will always be the best source of business for accountants they're warm leads it's a great source and it, it's ironic that you know when I talk to accounting firms and I know from my own experience that Everyone will say it, we get our new business from referrals, which is great. But at the same time, most firms will complain about the client base that they've got. They'll say we've got the wrong clients or we haven't got enough of the right sort of clients. So we need to link that to referrals and go, in that case, we need to better target our referrals. And that's the same as every other aspect of our business, just making sure that we are targeting our resources and our focus on our A clients to build that side of the business, not to let it just inevitably roll through B clients. Yeah, exactly. So I think we've shown that just with a little bit of time and investigation, looking at our current client portfolio, segmenting them, and also thinking about um, how we can attract more clients. So we've, once we've done that segmentation and we recognize the A, we start to think about what pulls those A clients together. Is there a theme? Is it the ethos, the culture of that, um, of that client and those clients that pull them together, which means that you can do a better job at talking to them directly and getting them into the business. So that's what, that's what we're trying to do. And I guess um, we've talked about busyness and time in in the sense of trying to um maybe segment clients and and gradually move them to the side but i think equally once you've pulled in an ideal client you know you need to ensure that you don't go down the same route again that you've sculpted maybe the onboarding, the way of working, you know, have that sort of verbal contract with them so that you set yourself up for success straight away. What, what do you advise um, from that perspective as well? I think it's very important that we, we know what the client journey is going to be through our firm, you know, right from before they are a client, when we're first thinking about our marketing um, through the engagement, through the, the onboarding. And, and, you know, onboarding is a process that can be fully systemized these days. There's, there's plenty of opportunities in the marketplace to do that. How we move them through the services that we want to offer them, how we develop that relationship. It, we, yeah. it, you know, it, we need to plan these th things out far more. There's, the, the, as, as a profession, we have been far too reactionary in how we run our own businesses. You know, if, if we're going to win a client, if we put all that resource and effort into winning a client, we want to make sure that we retain that client afterwards. You know, and they don't just get six months of great service because we're really focused on them and then things tend to drop off. We want to be able to promise them great things and we want to be able to deliver on those great things. And so we need to understand beforehand how we are going to do that. The, you know, the modern firm will be successful 
um, in a digital world by using the, the, the strengths of that digital world, by systemizing our processes. And, and by that, I don't just mean the compliance. In fact, systemizing every other aspect of our firm up to the levels that we systemize our compliance, which we're obviously very good at. But crucially, that's what then releases the people. That's what gives us time to work with our clients, to listen to our clients, to empathize with our clients and develop those relationships. So it's that back office systemization that earns us the right to sit down in front of clients. And it's using that combination together and focusing our time better that actually will enable us to do that and create a very powerful mix then. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. So um, I, I've had people comment around brand and marketing gurus, you know, and the, the fact that, um, you know, you can put all of the great marketing out there, you can talk to the ideal client, um, you can create this, this amazing kind of image, but then when they get to the accountant themselves, you know, that, that is not the reality. But I think what we're saying is we're, we're not talking about branding and marketing as a means of creating something that's not real. We want to really tap into the DNA, into the culture and the ethos of that firm and let people know straight away what they're going to expect. And so, of course, when they see the marketing, which is talking directly to them, they come um, and talk to the accountant. Hopefully, those two marry beautifully because their expectation has been met with what they're delivering. And then, of course, we have that journey defined, as you were talking about, with, with the sort of all of the different moments of interaction that, you know, down the line, six months, 12 months, there will be consistency in the service. We don't want to hoodwink. We don't want to hoodwink the client. We want to let them know and make it easy for them to choose that particular firm, don't we? Yes, there's no mileage in having an inconsistency between the brand and reality. Yeah, we've all experienced large companies who have the budget to create amazing brands. And then when you deal with them, the experience is entirely different. And it's even more frustrating than, than, than normal. We've all had the experience where we've sat down in front of potential new clients and we've sat there saying, look, we could do this for you and we could do that for you. And, and in the back of our minds, we're going, I hope I can deliver on these. I'm worried about our production. I'm worried about our service levels, whatever it may be. Yeah. Our brand must be an accurate reflection of who we are but on a good day. And then internally, we've got to make sure from a business point of view that we have a good day every day. That it, that's what it comes down to. So we're only going to attract the right clients if they are attracted by a brand that accurately reflects who we are. Otherwise, it's, mis it's, it's misleading. But if we don't have the time in the first place, and if we don't have that clear focus on who we're trying to attract, if we don't have that clear understanding of who we are, and making sure our business reflects that, then of course we're not going to achieve that. So I think too many people see branding and marketing and culture and operations as distinct things, but they're not, they're all wrapped into one. And that one thing is, is this persona that you're, of who you are, what you're trying to achieve and how you then interpret that into those different areas of your business. Absolutely. And I think the way of making sure that it really is part of the business is that every single person every single team member lives that and so when you are taking time out of your business to think about the ideal client to to plan the future of the firm it's very important that that is kind of written down there there is a recording of that um, and there is a recording of the plan if you like so that all of the team members know exactly where the business is going. And that makes them brand advocates. It makes them advocates for the business. They're happy there, they're productive. And of course, they're going to recommend on as well. They are the most important clients really at the end of the day. And, and this is why segmentation is such an important process and, and involving the team in that segmentation is so yes. important because once you've identified those A clients and those B clients and the C's and D's, but we're going to get rid of those. So let's focus on the A's and B's. Once you've identified them and you've linked them into how you are going to service those groups of clients, you've 
you've created these avatars for those groups of clients so you know what 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 an a client looks like what a b client looks like how you're going to approach those it gives a much clearer picture for all of the team not just the the, the director in the in, in the firm and that's where you get this consistency of culture coming through so okay. when you go through the process of segmenting it, the team have to be involved the team have to be part of that deciding who's an a who's a b Okay, so let's let's go back to that slide then. Let's put it up and let's talk about um, the homework, if you like, that people can do. Something that they can take away um, from this from this video that they can absolutely practically um, work on their business with. Well, my, my first piece of advice would be to not overthink this. You know, as accountants, we can disappear down the wormholes of data from time to time. So let's just look at this from a subjective level. I would you know, sit down there with your client list, with your team, and very, very quickly go through that list and say, OK, that's an A client, that's a B client, that's a B client, that's a B client, there's a C client. A, you'll find out where the discrepancies are between you and the team. Um, because you can have different relationships and you can have a client who maybe is great with you, but actually is quite rude and abusive to the team. So they would fit into that C category, for instance. Um, you could have a client who the team aren't particularly keen on, um, but you know that it works really well from a numbers point of view. And again, your relationship is different. So it will trigger some interesting conversations, but it doesn't have to be a long exercise because your gut reaction as to what a client is, is almost certainly the right reaction. Because the, the default test here is always relationship. I know as accountants, we like to focus on financial return. But if you have the right relationship with your clients, it's going to work for you financially. It, it's as straightforward as that. Yes, we can see from the B clients that we need to develop it, but it's a starting point that you can't create with C and D clients. So whip down your client list with your team very quickly, note, you know, write them down, A, B, B, whatever they may be, until you've completed that list. It shouldn't take that long at all. And I would also recommend that having done that, that that is something that then you revisit on a fairly regular basis, certainly every half year, ideally every quarterly, because client relationships change as well. So it's a good way of tracking where there's a relationship that's not working quite right that we need to put more attention to as well. But don't spend all day on this exercise. It's a quick exercise. But having done that, that will then, you can then say, okay, well, the first step is to identify what category each client is in. The second step is then to say, right, for our A clients, how do we want to service them? How do we want to manage that relationship? And for our B clients, how do we want to do the same? And what are we going to do with the, D, the Cs and Ds? And you can see on the slide there in red, I've just put some um, quick guidelines down, but Ds, get rid. Cs, either put them right or get rid. Bs, how are we going to systemize the process with these? The education side with B clients, I recommend these are one to many, the workshops, et cetera. And the A clients, okay, who's the A clients? It's going to be a relatively small list. How are we going to focus on building that relationship, building a closer understanding with those clients? Yeah, great. Thanks, Richard. And what I would say from a moving forward perspective, so again, looking at our firm and how we can translate that into a healthier, more sustainable business is absolutely what you said. Pull out the A, pull out the A clients, even put them into a different list. And then with your team, start to talk about what it is about them. Are there some similarities? And it's those similarities that we want to capture because that is the beginning of what is called the ideal client. It's as simple as that. It's those clients who work really well for you. You know, they, they fit with you. When you sort of hold up the mirror, you're kind of looking back at each other. You're, you're that similar. So you need to bottle that and start to write down what it is that um, makes you very similar and makes them ideal. And that will help you to start moving forward and talking to them in all of your marketing efforts. So that's really what we wanted to get across today, isn't it? That idea of time and being able to take control of our time, um, but also, you know, in, in a way that isn't about, you know, quick hints and tips, 
about good ways of working, but more from a let's look big picture at our business and our brands and how we can market and work with those ideal clients more effectively. So next week, um, well, in a couple of weeks time, we're going to be talking about culture, I think it is. So we've already talked about why it's important as an accountant to be different. We've now talked about um, the ideal client and how you can segment your client list so that you're working with the right people um, and making sure that they're valuable and also that they're not time wasters too. That is the key message um, from today. And then next time we will start to look at culture and how that affects um, brand, et cetera. Um, but this is myself and Richard. This is where you can get hold of us. If you have any questions for us, we're very, very happy to support there. Is there something you'd like to add, Richard, before we end? And no, I mean, in my experience, um, segmentation releases about 30% of time across the firm. So it's well worth doing as an exercise. Um, and yes, you're very, very welcome to, um, to contact me on the mobile or drop me an email uh, if you've got any questions or how to do it. Yeah. So that is the second video in the series of the Branded Accountants. Um, we hope you found that useful. Um, time doesn't have to be the enemy. We hope we've proven that. Um, and we will look forward to talking with you next time. Thank you very much. And thanks, Richard. Thank you.